Investments Private Limited, a wholly owned subsidiary of Noble Tech Corporation in the United States. Sir has over 17 years of industry experience spanning across manufacturing, design engineering, process and tool design, manufacturing planning, information technology and business process consulting. Sir has experience in managing and profitability growing offshore product development as well as professional PLM and engineering services business. Sir has been part of Noble Tech since 2008. Prior to joining Noble Tech, he was a director and member of the Global Executive Council at Geometric Global and was responsible for growth in business and operations. Sir also worked with Parametric Technology Corporation as a solution architect. As a Winchell certified consultant, he contributed to various consulting and implementation projects in countries across Asia such as China, Japan and Singapore. Sir holds a bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering from University of Pune. Sir, I welcome you to please share your words of wisdom and knowledge to enlighten us. The floor is all yours. It was your birthday. Thank you. Am I audible to everybody? Okay, thank you. Well, uh, good afternoon everybody, uh, all the students and the faculty members. Uh, it's actually very nice to be here and I'm really impressed with the facility and to see you all. Uh, and it's really my pleasure to have an opportunity to speak in front of you. I love talking to the young people and don't get me wrong, I'm not too old, okay? <laughs> but, uh, you know, I'm truly honored to be here uh, in, uh, to, to get an opportunity to speak to you all, okay? Um, well, today I'm going to speak about various aspects of, uh, you know, when you graduate from a business school, uh, you know, you always must be wondering, you know, what the corporate life must be and what challenges you're going to face and things like that. So I'm going to touch upon many aspects, uh, the way I have seen it in the world and uh, because I travel a lot across the world and uh, I've seen and worked with uh, multiple MNCs and seen their culture, seen our culture. Uh, we see where the country is leading and I'm going to touch upon a uh, lot of aspects like that. Uh, but I may sound at times like, you know, I'm delivering a commencement speech, you know. The commencement speech and, you know, as a student, uh, I always used to wonder when people graduate, why do they call it commencement speech? You know, the commencement is actually about, you know, you've done the hard work, you've done, completed your education and now you're entering into a corporate area and what's this commencement all about? You know, it's all over, you know, but uh, actually the word is at the right place because you're commencing your career right now. Okay. And I may sound like a commencement speech, it is really not for few of you who are actually going to graduate this year. Uh, you'll, you will see a lot of uh, things where, you know, I'm going to talk about the challenges and the, uh, you know, corporate world that you would see uh, when you join it. Uh, actually, uh, today you'll be joining a corporate world, uh, may not be today, but maybe a year down the line for the people who are actually into your first year and so on. But you would see a corporate world which is slightly different than what I saw uh, when I entered into a corporate world and that was about 17 years back. Okay. And for few of you, 17 years may sound like a little time span, you know, but for, for others, uh, you may think that, hey, this is the generation gap. Okay. And for those who are thinking like this is a generation gap, I'm with you, I'm with you on the thought process because 17 years is really a long time in today's world. It was not probably a few years back in our earlier generations, but 17 years is a big time in today's corporate world. I'll tell you why. Because today we are actually living in an exponential world, okay? And when I say that, uh, I'm going to throw a lot of statistics uh, in today's session, the things that uh, we have looked upon in the, on the internet and did some research and so on. And you would find some interesting facts 
about uh, what you would find, and you'll be surprised to know some of the facts if you don't know those. But many of you must have seen the uh, YouTube videos, and they became famous, uh, you know, in a few years since. But there have there been videos on uh, the same title, We Are Living in an Exponential World. And I was really surprised to see those videos because the kinds of figures and statistics that it talked about was kind of astonishing. Let me give you some uh, glimpse of it for those who have not seen the videos. You know, as we speak, every second, every second of time that we speak, there are five iPhones being sold or purchased worldwide. Five iPhones being sold every second in some corner of the world. Okay. There are about 5,000 YouTube videos being viewed every second. Okay. You will find that there are about 50,000 Facebook posts being made every second. Okay. And you're talking about seconds here. Okay. Each second, there are about 50,000 Facebook posts being made. And that is the kind of spread or popularity that Facebook has achieved in very short span of time. Okay. Now, we are talking about seconds here, but let's talk about some other uh, you know, numbers. Google had published a report um, in 2010, okay? and today we are already into 2012, so the numbers will be very different. But they said that when they started uh, earlier, they were hitting 2.7 billion searches on Google every month. Okay? So people were searching for information like crazy. 2.7 billion okay, in 2007. In 2010, that number got to 31 billion. Okay? In a short span of three years, the number of searches on Google worldwide had grown tenfold. Okay? And this is nothing but exponential. Okay? And I don't know what is the figure today. But again, I, I may assume that if, if not ten times, it could have easily grown five times. But one always keeps wondering, you know, why people are searching so frantically about for information on Google. And Google was not there a few years back. So wh what were these people doing? So didn't they need information? If yes, if they needed information, where did they go to? And for those who they seek the information from, did they know about it? And if not, where did they go to to find the information? Okay, so it's it's like an information overflow these days. You know, there's information available on the fingertips, and pretty much that applies to the uh, to our world as a common man. It also applies to the corporate world. Today, there's a lot of information being generated every hour, every minute, every second. Okay. Now, now you may wonder, you know, what these numbers, now this guy is throwing some numbers, how do they relate to us? Okay, how do we make sense out of those numbers? And how are they going to impact us? Okay, so let me, let me talk uh, like this, okay? So it's all about how our world is changing, okay? And how the market is responding to it, okay? Now, it's all about the numbers that I talked about. It's all about how many people in the world you can reach today. Okay? And that's the market we are talking about. It's no more related, it's no more confined to the local area, to the state, to the country, and so on. It's a global phenomenon now. Okay? Whether it's product, whether it's services, no matter which business you are in, you are always thinking of global. Okay? So the context is now always global. It's a globalized world. Now let me talk about some more statistics and this is really relevant to how products have reached to so many users worldwide. Let's talk about, let's take a number of 50 million users, okay. Now if you have to talk about different products and how much time they took to reach the lives of 50 million people, okay. In the early 60s, 1960s and so on, radios Radio was popular. That was the only means of entertainment, I think. That's what I have heard. I don't know. Okay. But, you know, radio took 30 years to reach to the user base of 50 million. Then came TVs in 70s and 80s. And 
it got isolated when the color TVs came into picture. But then even TVs took 13 years to reach to 50 million users. Okay. Now, in the 90s saw the internet boom. Okay, everybody was talking about internet, the businesses were changing because of internet and so on. And people started with the dot com era, where they started doing business on the internet. But you know, internet also took about four years to reach to 50 million people worldwide. Okay? And now let's look at today's scenario. It's all these are like products. Now if, if you talk about iPad, it took three years to reach user base of 50 million. Okay? Facebook took just two years. So the time for reaching 50 million people is just shortening, which means there are means of reaching out to more people, and which are, these means are getting more and more efficient. And it's like spreading like wildfire. So if you create excitement, whether you're selling products or services, if you create excitement in people, if they see a value, it will spread like wildfire. And you have made your mark right there. You will be successful as a global company. Right there. Okay. So these stats actually show growing means of reaching out to as many users and as quickly as possible. Okay. This is has a significant in, uh, significance in garnering attention from the user base because you have to make them interested in your product. Only then you uh, they will buy. It. Okay. Okay. And if you look at it. Uh, to reach this kind of user base. Now, today, Facebook has over 800 million users. Over 800 million, the way I say it, because as we speak, more and more users are getting added to Facebook. Okay. Now, with this traditional way of management, with the supply chain and those mechanisms, do you ever think that Facebook, Twitter, Google+, and all those IT products, apart from the hard products like iPad, would have reached so many people in a very short span of time. Probably it was impossible for them to reach so many number of user base with the traditional means of supply chain. And if at all they did, it would have taken many, many more years than they actually took to reach to these many people. Okay. And you know, talking about Facebook, with 800 million users as a user base, if, if the user community, the Facebook users were to form a country, it will be the third largest country in the world after in China and India. It's quite amazing. It's just getting bigger and bigger. And it's, the time is not far when it, it, it becomes a number one country in the world probably as a user community. Let's look at the significance of these numbers and in the exponential world on the era of education and also on the business. According to the US Secretary of Education, Richard Riley, he was interviewed in 2010 and he made three interesting comments and I had captured the comments from his speech over there. And it made me think, he made one step statement which said, Top 10 jobs in the United States in 2010 were not existing in 2004. Top 10 jobs, which means the jobs which are highly in demand were just not there for six years back, which means the jobs are getting created not by the positions or headcounts, but also with the nature of jobs that the technology is compelled to create. Okay? So that was a very interesting statement, I thought. Education, I mean taking that further, education is preparing students today for the jobs which don't exist today. Because we don't know when you graduate, when you came, come into the corporate world, what sort of jobs you'll be doing. Okay. Third, the jobs you land up with will use technologies that have not been invented yet. It's continuous invention is going on, continuous development is going on. And you know, in 90s, internet, uh, you know, impacted the way we do business in a big way. And, but that was just one. And it kept on happening like that with the new products coming into market. Whether it's web 2.0 and social community and community-based development and things like that. So it's just going like that, okay? Now, 
if you look at it on the business front, okay, uh, technology has significantly changed. We do business, okay. The generation Y or millennial generation, where most of you belong, I I belong to Gen X, okay, but many of you guys uh, really have different, tra uh, you know, different traits in you, okay. And every generation is different, you know, baby boomers, Gen X, Gen Y, and they talk about it. You know, why we should call it generations? And because every generation is believed to have different thread, uh, you know, traits, be uh, different behaviors, different characteristics. Okay. So if if you have to really uh, nail down a few of the characteristics that you guys own, okay. Um, most of you millennials are in many ways different. Um, in terms of you're more confident, okay. I see uh, the mo moment I talk to a lot of people like you, I feel that they're very confident than we used to be when we were your age, okay. You're opportunity seekers. You're very open-minded. You're, you're seeking opportunities in every corner of the world, okay. You're more socially active, okay. Thanks to all the technologies and Web 2.0, whether it's LinkedIn or Facebook and uh, the the uh, networking sites, you are more networked in terms of your uh, friend circle as well as your virtual connections with people uh, sitting geographically uh, at different places. Okay, you are tech, tech savvy. So whether it's it's uh, something to do with mobile phones or uh, technologies and so on, you are tech savvy. Okay? You are connected. You are always connected because you know I'll tell you. In, interesting story. I was sitting in a, on a plane um, in the United States when I was traveling and the plane landed. Okay. Until the plane is in flight, you're not allowed to use your mobile phones. Okay. And there was a teenager sitting beside me. Okay. And the moment the plane touched the ground, she flicked the mobile phone open. Okay. She started it. Say, hi love, you just landed. Okay. She texted. And the texting has become very famous now. And by the time she sent the first message to her boyfriend or whatever, and by the time we reached our gate, she had sent 15 text messages to the same person. Okay? And this is connection. I mean, you're always online. You're connected. You're talking. Okay? But you're talking. You're, you're connected wirelessly. You're wireless. And at times I, I see that you're clueless as well. <laughs> okay, but you're you're uh, the most important thread to me is like you're a global citizen. Now we are not talking about a local thing here, and I would like you to uh, you know have this image of yours in mind that you're going ahead. You're a global citizen. Always think from the global standpoint. You're a global citizen. Okay. As a result of this change, middle management layer in any organization is thinning, okay. I mean nobody would want to have big layers of management and traditionally companies had a big hierarchy of this person reporting to that, that person reporting to them, you know, so X, Y, Z, there, are, there were many uh, steps or hierarchical, uh, you know, reporting structures in the organization. And it was there for a purpose because if you were to manage the organizations efficiently, you needed that structure, okay. But again, thanks to the technology, because the information is available on the fingertips, the reporting is not a problem, okay. You find that a lot of uh, useful information is available, you are able to take decisions quickly. So you don't need a thick management layer in between, which slows things down, okay. And companies have also realized that, because many companies, whether you like it or not, see management as a overhead. You know, if you have to have 10 managers with high salary being paid for doing the same job, which can be done with one manager as well, you would prefer that. Because managers really don't contribute directly, is a belief in many industries. Okay. So the organizations are becoming flat because they have understood the merits of being lean and mean. Okay. Uh, this also means you may not have well-defined roles and responsibility, which means if the management structure has thinned down, you will be ending up working on multiple things which are flexible roles and responsibilities. So you may not know, because earlier 
the HR would have, would have given you the whole list of roles and responsibilities, do's and don'ts and things like that. But nowadays I see a very flexible kind of thing. You will do this, this, this and that's it. And you know, you figure out how you would do it exactly. Okay? So it's like the, uh, the definition is thinning, which means it's, it's giving you more openness to perform. It's giving you more flexibility to perform. And you should make the most of this opportunity going forward. Okay. There is a lean organization, you are not bound by too many constraints and there lies an opportunity for a true leader to exploit this and to get results with minimum means. When the organization is built with loose structure, it provides immense scope for leaders and they emerge from any corner of the organization, any function and from any level of the organization. When the organization is, uh, you know, in essence, uh, what this means is that we need to be quickly adapting to the change, okay? Um, and you will be successful in your career if you adapt pre pretty quickly and successfully, okay? Let me narrate a couple of stories from my own experience, okay? Uh, you know, after the, my graduation, after the engineering, I joined uh, Mahindra and Mahindra. The company, everybody knows, makes Scorpios, right? So, I actually started off on a production shop floor on the day one, okay? And uh, first day I went to the uh, shop floor. Uh, of course, the orientation was done, so I knew a little bit about what, what is manufactured there and so on. It was an axle line for one of the Jeeps, okay? And I sat on the table on the day one 22 year old, fresh graduate out of college. And there were 40 different, 40 operators or, uh, you know, workers standing around me and looking at me to assign them some work. I knew nothing about this, the shop, okay? And I said, oh my gosh, how am I going to allocate work to these guys? And I could really see in their eyes the way they looked at me they said, oh, char book padke aya, to boss ban gaya. You know, what does this kid know about the shop floor? And, and I actually talked to them. I had, I quickly opened the dialogue with them. I said, you know, what comes first, what goes next? And they also saw a change. I mean, they, they thought that I would start ordering every person to go and randomly assign to some workstations. But I said, what, what is done over here? What is done over there? How much time is take? What are the norms? How, what is the production throughput? And I started asking questions and they started cooperating. Okay. And th there I saw a lot of change in their attitude. I said, oh, this guy is open. This, this guy is asking right questions. The moment he is asking questions, which means he is seeking information. Okay. And from that point onwards, I saw a lot of different relationship with these people. Okay. And uh, I'm not boasting about it, but I could see that in my shift, when the operators actually operated, they gave 95% of throughput, whereas the average over there was 60 to 70%. That was a norm. And it was highly unionized company, right? I mean, just like any other large manufacturing company. And so they, they started giving me inputs. Uh, they started giving me the output as well. Okay. And we had quickly formed a friendship uh, with them and that's where I first learned my human relations lessons on the shop floor. Okay. But then, you know, after a while I started getting bored of, oh by the way, I also assigned, while I assigned work every day to these guys, I also assigned one machine every day to myself. And I used to start work on the machine just like them. And that's where all levels were crashed right there and they saw that this guy is one of us. Okay. But at the same time, at the back of my mind, I was just getting a little uh, frustrated because it was like, you know, flocking the herd. You know, I, I didn't do my engineering for that. And I, I always had a passion to go into design and so on and so forth. But, you know, quickly after six months spending on the shop floor, working on the machines and so on, I, uh, you know, acquired the skill that nobody could fool me on the shop floor, any shop floor, okay? And then I was rated as a highly uh, entrepreneurial guy and industrious person and all that. 
and I got a very high rating and as a result I said, uh, you know, I want to actually pursue my passion which is design. I went into design department and computer aided design was very new at that time. And the company had invested a lot of money on the hardware and software and those Unix workstations and things like that. And I quickly saw a productivity gain over there working on CAD, which I was working on the big drafting boards that you would have imagined. And I started training myself, I got myself trained, uh, we created some utilities which will, uh, you know, enhance productivity and so on. And I started training others also, okay, informally. But still, there was, there's always an inertia uh, in making a change happen. And one fine day when I was very confident that, you know, everybody has, is, is pretty conversant with working on CAD and that gives a lot of productivity gains, I went to my management, the general manager of the plant, and I said, if you want to see a change, if you really, I mean, he used to complain that we have made a huge investment in CAD and nobody's using it. So I said, if you really want to make a change, just remove the drafting boards one fine day. He said, what are you saying? The work will stop. I said, trust me, it will not. Okay, and he did that. Okay, and that made a big change. And you know, people started working on CAD, and not only that, but we enhanced it to a level where, right from concept design to manufacturing, everything was done digitally. And that saved a lot of effort and time and money uh, in the whole process. So I was selected to implement the product lifecycle management, and that's how I charted. I got into this space, which I'm still operating into. The product lifecycle management is all about helping companies develop products uh, in concurrent way, working with globally sequestered teams in a collaborative way, and bringing products faster into the market. Okay, so it helped me. It helped the organization. Second story, it's about um, as the introduction said. I worked with Geometric Software here uh, in for six years in Hinjewadi. And uh, I was actually working in line management. I was uh, heading a group for of about 100 people then. And uh, used to work very hard and we had a very good team. Okay? But then when the market opened in uh, year 2004, 2005, we, saw, we started seeing a lot of attrition happening. A lot of people started leaving the organization and it had hit to the level of 26%. Uh, that was very high and we were losing on both fronts where we were getting business but didn't have enough good people to deliver because when attrition happens, only good people leave. Okay, So management was wondering you know, what to do, how to restrict the attrition. It is always a demand and supply. Okay, If there is a huge demand in the market and the job market is open and people are getting double the salaries, they will quit no matter how good your, your company is. Okay, and that's where uh, you know they thought of getting me from the line management into HR function, and I said, wait a minute, why should I get into HR? Okay, neither do I have any qualification nor the experience to do this job, and the management trusted on me. He says, you know, they they said you're managing your team well, and we want a new thinking in HR, and uh, likewise new thinking in your line management, other managers as well. So I took that challenge, and within a year, we dropped our attrition level from 26% to 13%. And to do that, uh, we did several things. I mean, uh, both HR got benefited, I got benefited in the process. The organization got benefited. Okay. So these are some of the things of adaptability. Once you take a change challenge uh, on your uh, shoulders, you can deliver on it if you, as long as you're enthusiastic, as long as you want to make a change, want to make a difference, it can happen. And it helps both yourself in your career as well as the organization. And soon after, when we achieved that goal, I was then taken back into the uh, line management as, as a director, and I had a 500 people team working with me in my organization. It was, it was a highly successful business that grew multifold. Okay. So these are some of the stories I wanted to share with you from my own experience. Um, and that just shows the, uh, what is the importance of adaptability. You know, if you change your sales in the wind, you will sail pretty fast. Okay, you have to adjust your sales uh, with the wind. But coming back to our exponential world where we just left out, okay. 
Um, if you have to extrapolate the phenomena of the change happening in the corporate world and the education and business that we have seen, very soon, very soon, the time span between a person starts his education, three or four year degree education, and the time the person graduates, it's like substantial span of time, three to four years. Okay, we are talking about expon exponential world here. Okay, so which could also mean that half of your education is obsolete by the time you graduate. Okay, now the the the, uh, the day is not too far from here now. Okay. Well, while we are, you are graduating from business school today, you are commencing your career, uh, corporate career. Okay? And when you do that, um, do you know which problems you will be hired to solve as a business leader? You don't know that because the problems don't exist today. They will be created later on. There will be opportunities there which you will be hired to make the most of. But where are we today? Okay? Um, if you look at today's thing, you know, with the population of India, and if you assume that, let's say, let's, let's take 25% of our population which, with a higher IQ level, okay, the brighter people in India, and if you take that number, and if you take the total population of US, okay, we have, we have more brighter people than US has people. Let's understand that well. So, with the sheer numbers, Indians are known for their intellectual, uh, uh, you know, capabilities and so on. So, we have more brighter people than U.S. has people. But where are we as a country? Okay. And if you look at it, we are number, number two, okay, in the, in, in the whole world in terms of population as well as the GDP growth rate. And on both occasions, we are following China. China is number one on both. Okay? Soon we are catching up on the population part with China, but nowhere near on the GDP part. This makes us feel proud about our country. Right? I mean, we are number two. Come on. One can always conclude that we are lucky to be in this country and being at the right place at the right time. And there are opportunities galore. I mean, full of opportunities. If, if we are growing at that pace, which no other country is growing, it's great. I mean, there are opportunities which we, we are actually graduating. You guys are graduating at a time when the opportunities are big. The future looks nothing but great. Okay? But if you look at it, hold your breath. I mean, don't get excited. The dichotomy actually is, unfortunately, that we are ranked number 91 on the unemployment rate in this country. Where are we? Number two in terms of the GDP growth rate and number 91 in the world when it comes to unemployment. Shouldn't they go hand in hand? Shouldn't they are, are aren't they related to each other? They are. Okay? But that's a worrisome part and that's, that surprises everybody. You know, earlier this month, uh, the third Indian management conclave was held on August 9th, I guess. Okay? And the topic was, is MBA losing its sheen? And uh, the panel involved leaders from the industry, um, many industries, uh, whether it's automotive, banking, and so on. There were leaders from Hero Honda, ICICI, and Deloitte Consulting, and things like that. And they shared their experiences on how MBA grads lack necessary skills that the industry is looking for, unfortunately. Okay? And that, by the way, it's not limited to MBA, again. Okay? I'm not, uh, you know, cornering you guys on that. It, it pretty much applies to any education today. Okay? And if you look at it, but there are plenty of opportunities in the job market and that's true. It's not a hypothecation. I mean, it, it's not a hypothetic, uh, hypo, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, it's, it's not a case which is like thought about, okay, imagine. There are opportunities, it's true. Okay? There was a survey recently conducted and 500 recruiters in India were interviewed. And surprisingly, 61% of them said they faced talent crunch. 43% okay? of the recruiters said they have really tough time getting the right people in the 4 to 8 year span experience slab. Okay? And 
this this is a sorry state i mean yet our country at this stage where you know there is a talent crunch on one hand there are a lot of people and there are 9% of our graduate qualified people unemployed in this country i mean a big fuss is always made about the unemployment in the western world how about our own country it's more than 9% of qualified people were sitting at home doing nothing they don't have opportunities to me this looks like a issue of lot of quantity but lacking quality okay i have here with me my uh, friend and mentor uh, wing commander retired uh, ramesh dog and he has also been a missile man uh, working with dr abdul karam uh, <laughs> so he and i and two of our colleagues from the industry also we did our survey our research on this very topic last year and we presented a paper in the vishwakarma institute of management and the paper is published uh, it's on on my blog and anyone of you who is interested in uh, seeing that most welcome i would also uh, welcome your opinions uh, once you read the paper but it all talks about the uh, fact that where is the gap what are the possible reasons why there is a gap and what needs to be done to fulfill that gap okay so many leaders uh, we talked to i mean what we did essentially was we talked to a lot of people in the industry and also in the academic academia and we said what are the challenges what, what do you see lacking i mean just making a statement oh these guys are no good is not enough we have to solve that problem and if we have to solve that problem we have to also pinpoint where they are lacking okay if at all so we did the analysis on that and you know but we found many many different inputs which we have taken down on the paper but you know many leaders we talked to and also the panelists of the enclave you know conclave that we talked about uh they all agreed on one point okay and they said you know there are several possible reasons why uh, uh why this gap exists you know in terms of the uh number of people qualified people getting out of the graduation colleges and so on and at the same time they are not being employable in the industry and why is this happening okay and the possible reasons to uh, uh, such a gap was stated as maybe outdated syllabus okay it could be too generic course okay uh, not meeting the industry's needs or the uh, uh, you know expectations not having uh, you know industry specific curriculum because every industry has different needs okay whether you see oil and gas industry or aerospace industry and automotive industry energy industry and so on so forth every industry has different needs and requirements is the curriculum supporting that is it focused on that okay now some some people also said you know the professors who teach at these business schools really lack the industry experience okay um some cited that there are uh, there is too much theory and lack of practice okay uh the case studies discussed in the uh, different subjects uh, are actually at least a decade old okay and now we are living in a exponential world so so and so forth there were several reasons cited okay but these are and and these are possible factors which attribute to this gap however everybody agreed everybody ta we talked to agreed that the industry and academia has to work very closely together and this alone this step alone is going to solve lot of these problems okay the national business summit where we are meeting today is certainly a step towards that okay and i really applaud the uh, you know efforts of uh, uh, balaji institute for that okay really hacks off i mean these initiatives are something that we need and you guys need uh the industry needs as well as the students need where this gap has to be narrowed down and if not eliminated okay so we really need to work together very closely whether it's it's such sessions or there are many means of doing that but you guys need more exposure to the industry and the industry is also need what sort of talent is available in the market okay 
uh, well let me uh, give you a recent example okay how many of you have really heard about curiosity can you raise your hands many okay so this curiosity is not a curiosity but a robo that just landed on mars okay now this alone is an example and i'll tell you why okay this is a suv size robo right uh, the, the size of maybe tata sumo or safari or whatever you call it it's a suv it's a suv size robo and that side of robo not just with size but the weight had to be landed safely on mars okay and the whole operation had to be conducted at a precision okay which no other would have thought okay because there were billions of dollars um, in you know uh, invested into this mission and do, do you know who designed this robo no there was some link to indians but it's really not indians you know you would easily think that nasa would have designed this because nasa has been doing it for years but it's not really there's a laboratory called jpl jet propulsion laboratory okay and that laboratory jpl is part of california institute of technology it was completely designed in california institute of technology not by nasa okay and this is a recent example where we have seen what results we can achieve when industry and academic institutes are working together hand in hand there's a lot which can happen okay we stand at a moment where uh, you know business education has to regain society's trust and society uh, i mean it has to build the confidence that we are educating leaders for tomorrow who have both competence as well as character Now the last part is very important character okay the competence and character and will be working to ensure society's growth and prosperity that is the need of the hour today okay this is more relevant today since we live in a globalized world because in the problems are not limited to a particular organization or a particular state or country or a regional thing it's a global thing okay now um, no single person actually i mean if you if you work as a business leader no single person today has a monopoly on intellectual capital and your actions as a business leader are going to be having impact not just on you but many more people than you would ever think okay we have seen umpteen number of cases where the business leader made a mistake of thinking about himself or herself and the entire society got affected and the scams like satyam happened and there are more and more happening every day this is exactly because of that okay so what you should keep in mind as tomorrow's leader because you guys are going to be tomorrow's leaders first of all keep in mind that because you have done your mba okay you will not away you will not straight away land up into managerial positions some of you may those who are lucky okay but you are not going to land up in managerial positions right away okay so you have to earn that management position going forward with your results with your hard work with your smart work and so on okay uh just like the trust needs to be earned this also needs to be earned a leader must be able to lead the workforce and to do that you first should be able to lead yourself into the corporate world okay because some of you may join the corporate world and some of you may decide to chart your own path and be entrepreneurs but either ways you should be able to actuate yourself and then those around you okay so that's what is required as a leader and for a successful leader you should be able to understand your team that's a very very essential part of being a leader and to do that you should drop i and use we more often okay 
in, in your behavior and also in day to day operations. Okay, it's, it's always a team that performs. Okay. Every leader needs followers. Okay. There is no leader without a follower. Nobody will call you a leader if you don't have any followers. Okay. And your followers may not necessarily be your direct reportees. I mean, those who are reporting to you have been assigned to you as subordinates will see you as your boss. But that doesn't make you a leader. Okay. So, <clears throat> to begin with, in your career, you may not have any reportees at all. Because I said, you, you may not land up in a managerial position. Okay. So, if you don't have any direct subordinates, if you don't have any assigned followers, you will have to create followers for yourself. So, what does it take to create followers? Okay. You should be able to positively influence others, irrespective of the position and function and so on, within and outside the organization. Take people along and build faith and trust, because it takes time to build that. I mean, it never happens overnight. Lead yourself and also your team towards achievement of stated goals. Now, stated goals is important because you have to be goal-oriented. Okay? And always remember the four I's. Okay? First is inquire. Always look around, learn from it, and what new skills you can acquire going forward. Irrespective of what business you are in, why we are doing what we are doing. Because just setting a purpose, we want to be the number one company in the world. Why? What's in it for us? What's in it for you? Why we are doing what we are doing? Okay. Because if you don't know where you are leading, why would I want to follow you? Okay. So a leader has to set the sense of purpose. Okay. The fourth is about leading is not just about being the in the commanding position. And it's also not about setting the purpose. But it goes beyond that. And the most important part is you have to become a role model for others. Okay, when people see you that I want to become like him or her, that, that is a sure sign of a leader. Okay? Because people look up to you to follow you. Okay? And the key essential ingredient of that is your ability to interact and make connections with people. It's all about people. Okay? And it's about your relationships, how well you are able to create relationships 360 degrees, which means your bosses, your peers, and your subordinates, and also, on the other hand, your customers, most importantly. So if you are able to create relationships meaningfully, you would be seen as a leader. So what should be our goal? You know, we are coming to the end of uh, this thing. So the, the last message that I wanted to give you, and then again, I'm going to throw some statistics here. Okay. We talked about being, you know, India being number two in GDP growth and a lot of opportunities are there and so on and so forth. But look at it this way. The UN, United Nations, has given the world rankings and they have published it on the website. We are world number 113 in terms of gender equality. Okay. We are 120, number 128 on Human Development Index. We are 135 on Healthy Life Expectancy. We are number 140 on our water footprint. And we are 91 on Quality of Infrastructure. All other rankings are way down south. Okay? Not just that, but five of our cities, big cities in India, are actually ranked in the top 20 cities in the world which are most polluted. Okay? We are, we are also topping for, for the wrong reasons though. We are number one for road accidents, deaths worldwide. Our corruption perception index, okay, which is also a CPI, is 3.1. Zero being on the scale of zero to ten, of course, zero being the most corrupt. Okay, so we are very close to that. And we, we are very much aware of this monster in India. And I think there is a movement which is taking roots against it, but long way to go. Okay? And so much so that the corruption has reached our judiciary system, right from politics to judiciary system, the police department and defense and education and whatnot. Okay? 
our country is being talked about having a great advantage of demographic demographic dividend which means there are more young people in the country compared to the western world we have a great advantage of having a young country where the average age of the citizen is 25 whereas in western countries it's 40 plus now if that is the case when most of the people are young working what explains that only less than 3% of our people pay income taxes beyond explanation okay so if you look at it the things are not that hunky dory okay at the go uh, uh, as the government would like us to believe okay they always sell good things about it because they need votes but it's not about uh, being so bad it's not hopeless either okay so we have to work together to make it work we have to get those rankings up in the world okay so as Alex Alexander Hamilton once said you know I like that statement all that is necessary for the evil to triumph is for good men to do nothing those who stand for nothing and fall for everything and India is witnessing that kind of scenario as tomorrow's leaders you should look at all these challenges as opportunities because there lies a lot of opportunity and actively work on fixing these issues in every little way possible okay and using your leadership skills managerial skills whatever you have to influence and pursue it, the people around you and contribute towards bridging this gap okay only then we will truly help india become a superpower true superpower for tomorrow thank you